Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, April 22nd. Looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean, we see an area of windswell, local fetch, generating some seas off of Northern California, sort of junking things up on the Central and North California coast. We also see remnants of a gale here in the west, Northwestern Gulf, still generating 19-foot seas, but seas were higher as it pushed over the uh, dateline a day or two ago. And then a new gale developing off of Kamchatka with 24-foot eh, seas or so uh, pushing east. So still Still, the North Pacific is trying to be productive. As usual, we'll start this week's tour looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales, and when those gales form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, just like that right there. It's a pretty nice little trough in the Gulf of Alaska. Not particularly strong winds pushing down into it. Only, uh, what is that, about 110 knots, maybe 120 knots down there at its apex. But either way, that helps support a counterclockwise flow aloft and also down at the surface, and that is the hallmark of low pressure. And, of course, low pressure generates wind. Winds generate seas, and as those seas radiate away from the fetch area, that produces swell, and swell and hits your beach creates surf. But looking at the bigger picture, we have a pretty decent uh, jet stream flow, especially for the time of year. Yeah, a little bit split over Japan here, but this southern branch is so weak, it's almost not even there. All the energy is in the northern branch, pushing off of southern Kuril Islands, north Japan. Winds there, what, 140 knots pushing off, and actually almost a little trough trying to form right over Kamchatka. Of course, that the jet ridges a little bit over the date line, then falls into the trash track into the trough we just talked about in the Gulf of Alaska, eventually moving into roughly the Pacific Northwest. Let's take a look over the next couple days. That trough continues moving through the Gulf, starting to get pinched off and being less supportive of gale development as we get into Monday. But also notice that that trough just persists. And also notice the trough off Kamchatka builds with 140-knot winds feeding it into Tuesday. Now, this little trough here is still capable of generating low pressure off the California coast. It gets completely cut off as we get into later Tuesday, and the trough over the dateline now becomes the main area of focus. Focus. Still, given the late season of the year, probably low pressure, maybe a weak gale will form from it at best. The trough continues hanging. It's cut off from the main jet stream flow. Now, see the main jet stream flow pushing off Japan, dipping over the Dateline Western Gulf, and then ridging north into Alaska. Cut off trough, still probably capable of supporting low pressure off California on Wednesday. That just holds into Thursday and Friday before it finally starts moving inland. And also notice the trough in the Gulf of Alaska does the same thing. It's very steep, almost pinched off north of Hawaii, its apex there. But it too is capable of some supporting some sort of low pressure development as we get into Saturday. Now notice uh, on Saturday, the trough over uh, that was off of California is moving inland and the trough north of Hawaii gets completely cut off and it's off on its own and the main jet stream flow as we get into Sunday is pretty much running north almost over the Aleutians not super supportive of low pressure development but also look at this another trough sets up off California at 180 hours out probably good for only oh, a little cold air and maybe a little precipitation but that's about it um, so definitely, we're moving into more of a spring-like pattern now. Less energy in the jet, less temp temperature differential uh, between north and south of the jet to fuel storm development. And at some point here, everything will shut down. But maybe we still have another couple of weeks of some activity to look forward to. Next up, we take a look at surface level pressure, surface level winds. That sort of tells the picture of what we saw in the jet stream. Weak low pressure in the northern gulf. New developing gale, developing 40 knot winds, pushing off Kamchatka here on Sunday. Forecast to move over the northern dateline region, but not really getting any stronger. If anything, getting weaker. 35 knot winds as we get into Monday, pushing over the dateline to 30 to 35 knots on Tuesday, and then fading out late Tuesday night. High pressure pretty much in control over the Dateline region. Weak pressure pattern off of California, though. Just roll this out. Then here comes another low forecast, forecast off Kamchatka, but we know the jet is pretty much ridging over the Aleutians, and that low just moves up into the Bering Sea of no interest. But here we remember, we had this super steep trough here uh, north of Hawaii, and that is supposed to start feeding sort of a cutoff low here. Uh, 35 knot winds on Friday aimed right at Hawaii about what is that one two three about 900 miles north northwest of Hawaii 
There we go, and a little patch of uh, 40 knot winds aimed a little bit west of Hawaii, but maybe good enough to produce some uh, swell for sure. And up to 45 knots on Saturday, and then fading out. So we'll see. That's still kind of a reach for the models. Anyway, you get it 180 hours out. You see no real low pressure. We see high pressure, both a double lobed high pressure, one on one side of the dateline, one on another. And that sort of sets the tone for a full-on spring pattern and a, sort of a disintegration of the swell pattern for a bit in the North Pacific. So next up, we look at the wave models, and we're going back in time. We're going back to Thursday, about midday Thursday last week, the 19th of April. Small little gale developed uh, about halfway between the dateline and Japan, 25-foot seas, but it built, got some 45-knot winds, generated 28-foot seas pushing over the dateline, and not the north dateline, really just the, uh, you know, the normal uh, n decent position for northern California swell, not so much for a while. The fetch was aimed pretty much off to the east, but 28-foot seas, and then building to 30 feet on Saturday, and even maybe a little bit higher, supposedly 32 feet in one grib cell there, but we'll call it 31 feet. That's good for maybe a 16-second period swell on the front end of it, maybe 17 even, and then moving into the Gulf into Sunday, and it faded there as of right now. It's all but gone, but there is swell in the water pushing towards California, probably later Tuesday, Wednesday sort of time frame, even into Thursday. The good news is trade or winds are supposed to be pretty light in the California area at that time, and wind swell dropping down. So we had a similar sort of swell hit uh, California this past weekend, but for the most part, the swell was completely buried in chop at expo exposed breaks. So that gets us to current time. Here we are right now. And another small system to develop over the northern Dateline region Sunday night, 26, 27 foot seas, building to 28 feet, just barely making it to the northern Dateline region. That system kind of falls apart, 23 foot seas. That's capable of what, maybe a 14-second period swell? So a fair amount of swell decay as whatever swell from this thing is generated reaches its way towards California and Hawaii. But just the same, some swell should result uh, probably, when would that be? Over the coming weekend, uh, I think the deal is there's supposed to be pretty good winds in California in sync no, pretty, by pretty good, I mean pretty pretty brisk northwest winds in, in central and northern California as that swell hits. So that one's probably going to get lost to the chop too, And except if you have a good little uh, corner you can go hide in. Anyway, then we get into the Friday-Saturday time frame. The only thing of interest, that cutoff loaf supposedly north of Hawaii, 24, 25, 26, 28 foot seas, there we go, aimed a bit uh, uh, west of Hawaii, but still... Maybe a nice little pulse of swell to result for eh, late in the weekend or so into the early part of the following week, if you believe the model's that far out. But take what you can get. It's that time of year. There isn't going to be much left, and pretty soon we're just going to be dependent on either wind swell or something coming from the southern hemi. And speaking of which, let's take a look at the Southern Hemi, and let's take a look at what happened. We're going back a week to the 15th of April. A little gale developed here uh, south. Uh, in the far southeast Pacific, not particularly huge seas, was at 20, 22, 20, maybe 25 foot seas. And the uh, California cutoff right around in here. So seas, yeah, they're in the swell window. Not particularly big, though. You typically want to see about 30 foot seas to get some sort of a decent period on the swell. But still, maybe this is good for a 14, 15 second period swell. 25 foot seas just sort of simmering through the early part of last week up to 28 feet on Tuesday and then moving out of the California swell window. But then another fetch developed here. Again, 23 foot seas, 24, yeah, right? 24 foot seas, barely in the California swell window and then moving out as well. But still, over a multi day, what is that, a four, four plus day window? So swell is in the water pushing north. We're nothing much. We're talking maybe two feet and maybe two and a half feet at best at, you know, 15, sec 15 16 seconds uh, as it arrives in California this week, uh, mainly for Southern California, mainly from like, 175 to 180 degrees, but exposed breaks up in Northern California. You could see a little bit of energy, but remember, there's also larger swell going to be in the water. So for the most part in Northern California, the Southern Hemi swell will be completely masked and gone. Otherwise, nothing developed. Let's go take a look at the forecast. 
So here we are today's model, just sort of browsing through a little tiny low forecast to develop south of New Zealand on Monday night. Maybe a tiny area of 30 or 31 foot seas pushing northeast for about 24 hours and that fades out. Uh, so that would be good for swell, certainly for Tahiti, maybe it's some background swell for Hawaii. And then now see another gale develops, but it falls southeast. That's of no interest. And then really you get this kind of zonal pattern setting up, nothing pushing to the north. So that's it for the southern hemi. So swell this week, maybe a little pulse for Hawaii after that. And then things get quiet about the same time that the North Pacific goes quiet. Not a good sign. So make the most of what you can get now. Let's take a quick look at winds relative to Hawaii and California, and we're talking about mainly wind swell here. Yes, today, on Sunday, north winds, 25 knots off the North California coast, generating lumpy wind swell mixing with swell previously that arrived, when was that, Saturday morning or so, from, uh, uh, yeah, Saturday from uh, the North Dateline region. The wind swell was every bit as big as the swell from the Dateline. Kind of hard to tell the two apart. Anyway, and relative to Hawaii, uh, trades in the 15 knot range, but very shallow, probably not generating much in terms of wind swell. As we get into Monday, notice low pressure kind of sets up. Remember, there's this sort of a steep cutoff uh, trough sort of in this area at that time. Uh, winds die off, low pressure very weak low pressure off the California coast. But it was high pressure here rel just north of Hawaii. Maybe that would generate a broader area of trades, and that in turn could generate some wind swell. You see it there. So relatively calm pattern for California for when Tuesday, Wednesday, when swell is supposed to arrive. But good east trades for Hawaii. East short period, easterly wind swell. And then we continue on the trades start fading as we get into Friday relative to Hawaii, but then here's that low that develops north of the island. We can inspect that real close, up, cl up close. 45 knot winds over a tiny little area aimed at Hawaii, mainly in pockets, 40 or so knots. California still out of the wind. Actually, let's go about, look at Saturday. Yeah, so Saturday, wind's not too bad, mainly limited to Point Conception. That's actually an upgrade from earlier today. And then Sunday, though, the north wind machine kicks up, and that's pretty much the end of it for California. Uh, Hawaii, no trades of interest, really. It's all about the low north of the islands. That's a week from now. All right, let's go take a look long-term. What's going on? First, we'll examine the MJO, Madden Julian Oscillation. Uh, in this time of year, the MJO doesn't do a whole lot to support storm development either north or south. It's kind of a, a slack pat time in the year, but we'll take a look anyway. It gives us some hints. And then, of course, long-term, what's going on with La Nina, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So as usual, we like to look at winds on the equator, specifically in this thing we call the Kelvin Wave Generation Area. So this is the equator. This is the West Pacific here. That's New Guinea there. Right over here, assume the Galapagos just off the end of the picture here. Uh, actual winds per the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the Pacific used for monitoring El Nino, suggest, and we're just looking at the arrows here, those suggest, and this five-day average winds out of the east, that's what we expect, strong tra trades. But notice, in this thing we call the Kelvin Wave Generation Area from 170 west, over the date line, just 5 degrees north and south of the equator, over to New Guinea to about 135 east, light winds. If anything, maybe just a hint of westerly. That maybe suggests that the we thought the inactive phase of the MJO was going to be in control, but that pretty much suggests the other the exact opposite. If the inactive phase was in control, trades would be stronger than normal. They're certainly not. They're dying, it appears. In fact, look at this. Anomalies. Differences from normal from this time of year. See, yes, just the arrows we're looking at. Light easterly anomalies suggesting, yeah, trades are a little bit stronger in this area. But when you get into the Kelvin Wave Generation area, you can draw a box on it right about along in there. You see, trades are actually from the west, meaning perhaps the active phase of the MJO is waking up a little bit. So next we want to see what the forecast is, okay? So this is 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. 850 millibars is up about, oh, 40. 700 feet, uh, yeah, 4,779 4, feet to be exact. Um, and this is the whole uh, planet uh, on one chart, the Kelvin Wave Generation Area, 120 
east right there, dateline right there. So basically between these two tick marks going down, just look down. The reds are westerly anomalies. The blues are easterly anomalies. The dateline runs right down here. You see this pattern. Easterly anomalies east of the dateline, westerly anomalies west of the dateline. Then here's the forecast. Here's where we are right now. Yep, sure enough, westerly anomalies building on the dateline, and for the most part, expected to hold. There you go. There's your dateline. There's your Kelvin wave generation area. Expected to hold for the next week. That's a good sign, suggesting some sort of weak active phase of the MJO. Looking a little bit further out, specifically at the MJO, and of course the active phase of the MJO helps support storm development in winter months in the northern hemisphere, and sometimes uh, also nudges the southern hemi along a little bit, so it's worth monitoring the MJO. Uh, right now, this is outgoing long wave radiation models we're, we're looking at here. The yellows suggest positive anomalies, suppress hot, it means uh, high pressure means uh, um, the inactive phase of the MJO, more sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface. So we can say the inactive phase of the MJO is over the dateline. There's New Guinea. There's the Galapagos. The equator runs right through here, something like that. Okay, And then the blues suggest less sunlight reflectivity, meaning clouds, meaning low pressure, meaning the active phase of the MJO. Anyway, you get the idea. Five days out, inactive phase supposedly still holds uh, in the dateline region. But by, uh, let's say, eight days out, the active phase of the MJO starts moving west, starts filling the Kelvin wave generation area. That, again, is right from about here. Just draw a little box right in that area. Uh, that uh, about two weeks out. That's per the statistic model. The dynamic model, not quite as generous, suggesting just a dead neutral pattern in two weeks out, maybe a dead neutral pattern biased towards the inactive phase. So a little bit of disagreement between those two models. Let's dig a little deeper. Phase diagram charts. Assume you're looking down on the North Pole here. The active phase moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean to the Maritime Continent, over the West Pacific, over the Dateline, under the United States, across the Atlantic, across North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. Round and round she goes. And it takes, spends about eh, three to four weeks just making the, the trek across the Pacific. That's what we're focused on right here. The heavy dot is where the active phase is right now. So we'll say maritime continent, roughly over Bali, something like that. The green is the track it's supposed to take. If it's inside the circle, it's in, we'll call it inside the cone of death or cone of silence. Very weak. It needs to be out like here. That's where the active phase is more strong. This is where it was in April 10th, 11th, 12th. You get the idea. It's very weak right now. Basically supposed to move into the West Pacific, but remain very weak for the next two weeks. That per the ECMF model, the GEFS model, Ensemble GFS, basically says the same thing, saying no real support from the MJO for doing anything to feed the storm track for the next two weeks. And then finally, the upper level model, this is jet stream level. The green support suggests areas, favorable precipitation, the yellow is not favorable. You could say this would be the inactive phase, this would be the active phase. There's New Guinea, there's the equator, there's uh, the Galapagos right there. Now this runs a, a bit ahead, about a week to two weeks ahead of what's actually going on down at the surface. So the inactive phase is supposed to move out of the picture by, we'll say, the end of the month. Active phase crossing the Pacific into about mid-May or so. Then another inactive phase doing the same thing, making its trek across. And then the active phase again pushing into the West Pacific. Oh, end of May sort of thing. And then, of course, our favorite model, the CFS model, this is 850 millibar winds. Same sort of deal. Kelvin wave generation area, you can see it right here. This is, this is in reverse, so past history is what's down here. The forecast is forward. You see, the day, here's the Kelvin wave generation area between these two tick marks going up. Strong Kelvin, or strong um, uh, active phase of the MJO in the February time frame created lots of westerly anomalies over the Kelvin wave generation area. That has created a Kelvin wave. That is tracking to the east right now. We'll get into that in a minute as we start examining the subsurface ocean profile. Anyway, here's where we are today. You can see just weak westerly anomalies, right? So there's the dateline, little patch of easterly anomalies east of the dateline, little patch of westerly anomalies west of the dateline. Now here's what's interesting. We're going to overload the MJO. The dotted contour is the inactive phase of the MJO, and this line's going to inch up. So we're at the peak of the inactive phase of the MJO, but yet we have westerly anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area. That is a very good thing and something we haven't seen for two years now. That suggests some sort of significant change is going on in the atmosphere. We'll get into that in just a minute. Anyway, so as we continue on, westerly anomalies 
light yellow here, to prevail for the next, eh, into the end of, of April. And then we get into the solid contour here. That's the active phase of the MJO, a very weak one. Westerly anomalies continue still. And yet another weak inactive phase. Now these blues here, that's over in the Indian Ocean, 120 east right there. So in the Pacific right here, westerly anomalies or just neutral anomalies forecast till we get into the early June time frame when a much stronger active phase of the MJ was forecast with good solid westerly anomalies. So it seems like westerly, we're biased towards westerly anomalies now, and the dividing line is somewhere right around here. The only time we really had good solid westerly anomalies were during the active phase of the MJO. Now they're sort of supposed to become a habit. That's what you want. That sort of biases the whole North Pacific, or the whole Pacific for that matter, much more towards storm production, where last year the bias was in the Indian Ocean. That's where all the storm activity was. And how do we know that? Well, we can look here, overlay the low-pass filter. And the solid contour here is where we call the bias favorable towards low pressure. You see, last year, even, uh, we're talking even in January, the low-pressure bias was like between 160 east and 130 east. That's, that's basically favoring the uh, Indian Ocean and the maritime continent. But now notice... The leading edge of the low pressure bias is to be completely filling the Kelvin wave area somewhere around May 8th or so. And then not a, notice, not it's not only just one contour, it's two. And then as we get into July, three. That suggests a much more favorable climate in the Pacific for storm production. This sort of thing just doesn't disappear. You know, once it sets up, it's there for months at a time, if not a year at a time or more. That looks good or later this fall into the winter. Also notice this dotted contour, that's the area favorable for high pressure bias. That was in control of the Dateline region uh, all around December, January. Notice it is already out of the Kelvin wave generation area and supposed to set up somewhere, you know, basically off the coast of California sort of thing and make no progress. Now that that's not good for precipitation, but as we get into the fall, one would imagine that that would just continue to push off to the east and the this low pressure bias would fill the bulk of the Pacific. But too early to know for sure. Never believe a model even more in a couple of weeks out, much less a couple of months. But the pattern does look favorable. All right, let's talk about subsurface temperature variations. West Pacific here, East Pacific here. We're looking at depth. These little X's are the sensors on the TAO buoy anchor lines. Okay, with from those sensors, you can get a sense, of, you get a, a feeling for what the water temperatures are. Warm water here, this is 28 degrees Celsius in the West Pacific. Warm water building into the East Pacific, but much shallower, but looking way, the, the thermocline is deeper than it was a couple of months ago. That suggests La Nina is probably losing some of its punch. And this 28-degree line, it was locked solid straight up and down here on the uh, date line. Had been for months as a flow of cooler water at the surface was just beating it back. But notice it's making a little bit of progress to the east. The thickness of the 24-degree isotherm here is at least 100 meters deep at 140 west and now building to... 75 meters at 120 west, that's south of California, and still about 25 meters so limited near the Galapagos. Anyway, that's actual temperatures. It is the differences in temperatures from normal for this time of year, and you see this flow of warm water, two, three degrees above normal on the date line, all flowing east, a big pocket of two degree, positive two degree anomalies in the East Pacific, flowing into the Galapagos, to all this area here, this is a Kelvin wave. Uh, a month ago, we had big pockets of cool anomalies below one, two, maybe even three degree below uh, normal temperatures in this region, all gone, wiped out by this Kelvin wave starting to build its way and starting to erupt, we think, at the surface in the area of the Galapagos just in the past day or two. Now, notice there's this one little pocket of cool anomalies, not even one degree below normal. This is the remains of La Nina, and all this is just right on the equator, just a couple of degrees north and south of the equator. A different modeled view using the same data. Uh, uh, this shows four degree anomalies on the date line. You can see the Kelvin wave very clearly. If we put this, if we had this in motion, you see the leading edge of this warm water just continuing to push to the east, 
just about ready to break the surface at 105 west. The last little bit of cool anomalies from La Nina are all getting squeezed to the surface by this in, in, uh, uh, eastward moving Kelvin wave. Kelvin waves generated by that strong active phase of the MJO back in February that created westerly anomalies, took warm water here, pushed it to depth, and now it's like a river, just flow, or, uh, like, almost like an avalanche of warm water pushing up towards the surface in the East Pacific on the equator. This is very good news. Sea level anomaly data, basically strip out all the waves, strip out the wind swell, strip out the tides. This is from the Jason 2 satellite. There's uh, Central America right there, Peru right down there, Australia there. You see a bump, 5 centimeter, 10 centimeter anomalies right here on the date line. That's war that suggests warm water at depth. Warm water, of course, expands a little bit. That creates a bump on the ocean surface. And notice it's, that is traveling or that pattern is the whole way across the Pacific on the equator, almost making it to the Galapagos now. That is the Kelvin wave that is pushing east across the equatorial Pacific. And uh, just more confirmation of what we saw in the other data. And yet one more way to look at the same sort of thing, upper ocean heat anomalies, upper 300 meters of the ocean surface. Going back into West Pacific here, East Pacific here, the blues are cooler temperatures, the yellows, reds, warmer temperatures. Back in August, this was our La Nina, cool water. Where's the date line? Right there. Cool water filling the eastern equatorial Pacific. But then we had a little Kelvin wave push east in the January time frame. Didn't really do much, but it sort of cut the legs off of La Nina. Then we had the upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave cycle. A little bit of cool water redevelop, but that's normal. And now a much stronger Kelvin wave. This is the one we're watching right now, making it to 105 west. The Galapagos are right here, about 95. Um, the expectation is this Kelvin wave and a lot of warm water is going to start gar gurgling to the surface just east of the Galapagos, and pretty much that will wipe out the last remnants of La Nina. Now let's take a look at the ocean surface. We've seen subsurface. What's going on actually at the surface? That's what matters most to us. There's Peru right there. There's the Galapagos. This is the equator. Out to about 160 west, there's Hawaii right there. And it's just 5 or degrees north or south of the equator that we're interested in. So we see cool water erupting along Peru. I mean, that's kind of normal. But what we also suspect is going on is the Kelvin wave underneath is squeezing the last little bit of La Nina's cool water to the surface here along Peru, off of Ecuador, between the Galapagos. Now we also see this pattern, suspicious pattern, of just very weak warming from the Galapagos and points west of there. We think this is the very leading edge of the Kelvin wave just making its mark. Now this has been holding for about a week and a half, two weeks now, something like that. We expect to see much str a stronger warming signal in this area any day now, certainly by next week. Um, you know, maybe more something in that shade of red in this area and probably right around somewhere in here. Anyway, so weak warming. You even see some warming down here off of Chile. Good bit of warming off of Central America. The whole north side of the equator is already pre-warm. This is the last little bit of La Nina at the surface right in this area here. All right, let's go take a look at the trend for the next seven days or, or the past seven days. So we see we're looking for some warming. We see this batch of warming temperatures right around the Galapagos here. The thought is maybe this is the this is just the seven day trend, right? We've had a lot of warming right here by the Galapagos. I'm wondering if that is the uh, uh, um, uh, eruption point for the new Kelvin wave. A little bit too early to know. We'll keep watching it. You do. You should too. And we'll see what happens a week from now. See if this is building, expanding in coverage. Last little bits of cooling here along Ecuador and a couple little pockets here, but not really pretty much a, a just a steady state pattern right in this area. Warming off, weak warming, you know, off of Mexico and also south of the equator. Now, the interesting part is, and we'll see it in a second, the last of La Nina is right in here, and what this is suggesting that even in that area, warming is going on. We'll try it this way. Here we go. Here's the, uh, the sort of the overview of sea surface temperature anomalies. You see there's that cool water erupting along the Galapagos, between Ecuador along Peru. We think that the Kelvin wave squeezing the last cool water to the surface there. Here's this sort of nebulous area of warming going on in this area. But 
you know, not not a clear indication yet that the Kelvin wave is erupting fully in that area. And then here is the last little bits of La Nina out here, more like a Madoki La Nina at this point. Um, you know, not really controlling the equator anymore, mainly south of the equator. And this here suggests, okay, so we're talking 160 to 120. So 160 to 120 would be this area right here. And what this is suggesting is that this area right here is warming. So even what lingers of La Nina is fading and getting, war and getting warmer, and that's a good sign. And we have more evidence of that in a second. So what's going on in the atmosphere? We look at the Southern Oscillation Index, difference in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin. When you have a string of negative numbers, that means pressure is falling in Tahiti and getting higher over Darwin. That suggests the active phase of the MJO. We have just a hint of that right now, nothing more, four days worth of readings. That does not make a trend. But you notice, looking back the past month, all the numbers have been positive. So that is a step in the right direction. 30-day average sort of it takes all the, the noise out of this and suggests, yeah, sure enough, look at that. We were up at around 11.63. Now we're falling. We're down to 9.35. So that suggests the inactive phase of the MJO is fading out. Maybe the active phase or at least a neutral phase is coming in. And the 90-day average SOI, that takes even more, takes the S takes the MJO out of the equation and just gives us a sense of what's going on La Nina, El Nina wise. See the index is consistently between and we'll say two and a half and five and a half, but falling to four point one today. So that's still La Nina at just barely and seems to be a fading La Nina. Now the better news is the ESPI index. So that's sort of like the Southern Oscillation Index, only it's the difference in precipitation between the area north of Darwin and the area over the equator here. If there's cool and there's the Galapagos there, of course, and uh um New Guinea right about there. When you have cool water in this area, think La Nina, well, it's hard to get evaporation when you have cooler than normal water, then, you know, so you don't get uh, storm development, and that is the hallmark of La Nina. But when temperatures return to normal in this area, or they even start warming, then you get enhanced um, uh, precipitation, more cloud cover, that feeds energy up into the jet stream. The jet stream gets stronger both north and south in, uh, of the, you know, northern hemi and southern hemi, and that helps feed the storm track, and then you're in a lot better situation. So the current value today is minus 0 0.44, so still meaning a little bit of cool water here, meaning a little bit less precipitation than normal, but way better than where we were in the height of La Nina. We're down at minus 1.9 or something. And we've been hovering about minus 0.1 the past couple months, but now it seems that we're on a definitive upward trend. The value is still negative, but 0.44. We're, gonna, we're waiting for this guy to get to zero or even start turning positive. Now it's going to probably be another two to three months for that to happen. When it does happen, that means we're back in business in the Pacific. And uh, but by the time that happens, I think we'll be into about the middle of the summer or so. And then once that happens in the ocean, the atmosphere starts responding in kind. It's still going to take a little while for the global circulation to change, to sense this change. But it will at some point. And I think as we get into the fall, uh, probably the later fall, things are going to start looking a lot better. Then finally, the forecast, sea surface temperatures for the Nino 3.4 region, the official El Nino monitoring region. Right now, where are we? We're in late April. Temperatures maybe just a little bit below normal. In fact, let's go find out where they're at. Here's the Nino 3.4 index real time. Today, half a degree, 0.508 below normal. But you can see, warmest it's been for the most part, with any steadiness in quite a while. Yeah, we had a couple little spikes here back in January and February, but mainly we were hovering about three quarters of a degree below normal. Now we're up to half a degree below normal. We want to see that get up to normal at least. And this model suggests that temperatures are, in fact, to return normal about June 1st, hover there the whole way through the summer, and then maybe lightly turn warm as we get into summer. We're talking 0.2 tenths of a degree. But you know what? There's some other data that suggests maybe something else is going on. So here's sort of a consensus model, if you will. Here's every dynamic model, every statistical model used for measuring the or, or for predicting the onset of El Nino or La Nina. Okay, dynamic models, statistic models. You get a sort of get look at the trend, 
doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out that as we get into about the May time frame, according to all these different models, we should be neutral, have zero, you know, basically La Nina dead. And all these models are suggesting perhaps a, well, there's half a degree above normal. We'll say half to maybe three quarters of a degree above normal as we get into October, November, December time frame in the Nino 3.4 region. That's minimal threshold if it held for three consecutive three-month period uh, periods. That's minimal El Nino region. Now, we certainly don't want to go and start hyping things up here because we don't believe that to be true. Anyway, Here's the raw data from all the models. We're not going to go down there. But you can sort of look. The average of all models, and as we get into the fall, yeah, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, and that is December time frame, 0 0.8 degrees above normal. That's not really much of an El Nino. Certainly nothing to get worked up over. But what it does suggest is the models are saying at least we're going to get to neutral as we get into the fall and maybe a little bit above that. Now, if you wanted to be a hype monger, okay, here's the mid-April model-based probabilistic and so forecast. The reds are the probability for El Nino. And as we get into September, October, November, December, they're saying 60, 62% chance of El Nino, virtually no chance of La Nina, and a 30 or so percent chance of just neutral. We're going to be conservative, say, odds are it's going to be neutral this fall and winter, but it's a nice little tease to see the models at least sort of nudging towards some sort of an El Nino. We think it's too early for that. We think that the ocean needs another year or two to recharge from La Nina before we get any sort of a meaningful El Nino. In fact, we don't even want El Nino to form because if it does form, that will discharge the, any latent heat energy in the ocean. And then right behind that, you're back into La Nina. So let's just hope that it's kind of neutral and that just sort of percolates along for the next couple of years, building up energy so we get something stronger maybe maybe three years out or so. Anyway, by all objective measures, it appears that the La Nina is fading out and that we're moving into a much more favorable pattern long term for storm development in the North and the South Pacific Oceans starting yeah, about three months out or so. That's good news. In the meantime, yep, little, another little spurt of two different small uh, swells from the Dateline region uh, this week. Uh, maybe some uh, local swell for Hawaii, a little bit of southern hemi swell mixed in for southern California. Uh, so make the most of that. After that, things look kind of dismal, but not to be un uh, that's not unexpected given the time of year. And then, of course, long term, our trend is looking favorable. A much more positive outlook as we, if we can just suffer through the first part of summer, even late part of summer, things might wake up. We might start being in business. Anyway, that's it for this week. We'll do it again next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.